Я не, не понимаю, вы почетче, почетче. I don't understand, speak more clearly. Кто-нибудь один, скажите. Я... One of you can speak clearly to say what you want to say. Не хотите. I see you don't wish to do so. Very well. The Middle East region faces unprecedented risks to the security, well-being, and peaceful lives of its peoples. Waves of violence are spilling out far beyond the Israeli the Arab-Israeli confrontation zone and are destabilizing the situation in the Persian Gulf, the Red and Mediterranean Seas, and Northern Africa. A frank and honest conversation is needed on how to immediately stop the bloodshed and the suffering of civilians and to move towards a long-term settlement of both long-standing and relatively new conflicts. Our country has historically maintained good relations with all the countries of the region. The USSR was the first state to recognize Israel de facto and de jure, establishing diplomatic relations with it immediately after its Declaration of Independence in May 1948. At the same time, Moscow has steadfastly supported the establishment of an independent and viable Palestinian state and the realization of the Palestinians' legitimate and fundamental right to self-determination. In 1949, we supported Israel's application for membership in the UN, provided, and I stress this, provided that GA resolutions 181 and 194 on the partition plan for Palestine and the right of return of Palestinian refugees were implemented, and this was clearly stated when we voted to admit Israel as a UN member. Likewise, today we support the membership of Palestine in the UN. And I note that Palestine's sovereignty as a state has already been recognized by nearly 150 states who are members of the United Nations. We maintain a position that is based on the norms of international law within the framework of various international formats for the settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and, more broadly, the conflict in the Middle East. We believe that it is imperative to implement UN decision, including the above-mentioned first resolutions of the General Assembly and key security resolutions 242 and 338 adopted after the end of the Six-Day War and the 1973 October War or Yom Kippur War, as well as resolutions 478 and 497 on the status of Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. We attach particular importance to dialogue with the Arab states and their neighbors, Iran and Turkey. From the outset, we have highly valued the constructive potential of the Arab Peace Initiative launched by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 2002. At the same time, as you well know, we respected the decision of the number of Arab states to normalize relations with Israel prior to the resolution of the Palestinian question. We have supported the inclusion of pan-Arab and Islamic organizations, namely the LAS, the League of Arab States, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in the collective efforts within the quartet of international mediators, which unfortunately was buried under the ruins of the so-called American deal of the century. The colonial and mandate-based past of the Middle East and North Africa was and remains a burdensome legacy for the countries of the region. The Sykes-Picot Agreement, the Balfour Declaration, and the so-called White Paper laid time bombs that continue setting off to this day. The situation is made even worse by the West's new geopolitical experiments. We are convinced that the countries of the region should independently, without external interference, determine their own paths towards strengthening the sovereignty and independence of their countries and social and economic development for the benefit of their peoples. This will make it possible to unlock the enormous global, historical, civilizational, religious, and cultural significance of the Middle East and North Africa in the interests of peace and stability. Today, the most critical and urgent issue is, of course, the Palestinian one. This is the fourth time in 10 months that the UN Security Council has met at the ministerial level. Four resolutions have been adopted. However, the ongoing bloodshed in the occupied Palestinian territories only reaffirms that all of these decisions have remained ink on paper. Russia has consistently opposed terrorism in all its manifestations. We unequivocally condemned the terrorist attack against Israel 
of October 7th, 2023. However, what is now happening in Gaza is unacceptable collective punishment of the civilian population. The military clearance of the Gaza Strip, the most densely populated place on the planet, which for years has been called an open-air prison, has been underway for nearly 300 days. The large-scale military operation which Israel has conducted together with its American ally has resulted in horrifying statistics in terms of casualties and destruction. In 300 days, in 10 months, let's, let's put it that way, in 10 months, there have been almost 40,000 dead and 90,000 injured Palestinian civilians, most of whom are children and women. This is twice as many as the number of civilian casualties on both sides over the 10 years of the conflict in southeastern Ukraine. 10 months have yielded twice as many civilian casualties as 10 years of the conflict in Ukraine after the coup in February 2014. According to the Independent International Commission of Inquiry, violations of international humanitarian law, approximately half of Gaza's population consists of Palestinians under the age of 18. This means that they were born and raised under a total blockade, and in addition to the current escalation of violence, they have lived through other Israeli military operations such as the summer rains and autumn clouds of 2006, hot winter and cast lead of 2008 and 2009, the Pillar of Defense of 2012, Operation Strong Clift of 2014, and Guardian of the Walls of 2021. Today, Gaza lies in ruins. Housing, schools, hospitals have been almost completely destroyed, and key civilian infrastructure has been rendered inoperable. Infectious disease epidemics, widespread hunger, and a genuine humanitarian catastrophe have unfolded in the Gaza Strip. Safe and sustainable access to all those affected and in need is simply non-existent as fighting continues. The number of casualties among UN and NGO humanitarian personnel is nearing 300 people already, and this is the greatest one-time loss of life for the UN in modern history. Many humanitarian workers were killed along with their families. We express our condolences to the relatives, loved ones, and colleagues of the deceased. On May 7th, an operation was launched to clear Rafah, which is the last remaining refuge for one and a half million Palestinians who have fled here from all over Gaza. The Rafah crossing was shut down. The Strip has once again become, and I quote, the only conflict in the world in which people are not even allowed to flee, end of quote. That was said by our Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, back in 2009 when he was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Nothing has changed since then. The situation has only deteriorated further. The border crossings on the Israeli side are functioning intermittently and with severe restrictions. Far less cargo is being allowed through than was the case even before the current confrontation when the needs were far lower. The situation is also becoming dire in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, where Israeli military raids and settler aggression continue unabated with casualties on both sides. Contrary to the demands of UN Security Council Resolution 2334, Israel is not only not decreasing, but is in fact accelerating the construction of illegal settlements. In addition to the expropriation of land and the demolition of Palestinian homes, it is retrospectively legalizing settlement outposts, the construction of which has been recognized as illegal even under Israeli law. Such unilateral actions to create irreversible effects on the ground, which is something that was addressed by Mr. Ratre, are grave violations of Israel's obligations as the occupying power. These obligations, I note this, stem from the Geneva Conventions adopted 75 years ago. And an irony of history, they were largely adopted to protect Jews from the inhuman treatment and suffering inflicted upon them during World War II and to prevent any 
future persecution on the basis of nationality in the future. Colleagues, the current unprecedented explosion of violence in the Middle East is largely a consequence of failed U.S. policy in the region. It is a consequence of the very diplomacy, the effectiveness of which U.S. representatives have been telling us about for almost 10 months now as they demand that we draw down our efforts in the Council to give way to their individual efforts, which was said by my colleague Anthony Blink. And they use their veto power time after time to block calls for an immediate, permanent, and comprehensive ceasefire. When Resolution 2728, with its provision on a cessation of hostilities for Ramadan, was adopted, the U.S. immediately declared it non-binding. In return, we received the infamous Biden plan, which the U.S. intended to approve even before receiving a response from Israel when everyone knew the response would be a negative one because Israel was not interested in any plan with a hint of peace, which is something that we were able to see one again, once again today. And I would like to ask the U.S. representative in this regard, in listening to the statement made by the representative of Israel, did you not get the impression that you were perhaps in the wrong room and you were not in the right discussion, not in the discussion that was announced, and I hope you understand what I'm referring to. That is why we abstained from voting on Resolution 2735, knowing that it had already and tacitly been rejected by Israel. By providing diplomatic cover for Israel's actions and supplying arms and ammunition, Washington, it is clear to everyone, became a direct accomplice in the conflict, just as it has done with the situation in Ukraine. If the U.S. were to end its support, the bloodshed would stop, but the U.S. is either unwilling or unable to do so. What matters to them, it seems, is not saving human lives, but various maneuvers that would help to score more points during the election campaign. I would like to once again outline the key principles of Russia's approach. We condemn the terrorist attack of October 7th, which, however, cannot be used as a justification for Israel's current actions and to undermine the very idea of the establishment of a Palestinian state. We advocate a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire, which will make it possible to release the 120 Israeli hostages and nearly 9,500 arbitrarily arrested uh, Palestinians who have been arrested since October 7th. We call for safe and sufficient humanitarian access to all victims and those in needs. We reaffirm the key mandate of UNRWA as a unique body for providing assistance to Palestinians in the occupied territories and in neighboring Arab countries. We insist on an immediate cessation of unlawful settlement activity. Addressing these urgent issues would create the conditions for a return to peace negotiations on a universally recognized international legal basis in the interest of establishing an independent sovereign Palestinian base, a state coexisting in peace and security with Israel. Only then will the historical injustice done to the Palestinian people and their fundamental right to self-determination be redressed. It is also very important to restore inter-Palestinian union, which is something we have always sought to facilitate by providing representatives of various Palestinian movements the opportunity to conduct the much necessary needed dialogue through the Moscow platform. We are convinced that Palestinians are capable of independently determining their own future without external interference, no matter how much anyone might wish to decide everything for them and against their will. And this, by the way, applies to Gaza's future as well as an integral part of the Palestinian state. We are all well aware of the behind-the-scenes contacts uh, and plans that are underway, which attempt to predetermine the future of Gaza and the entire Palestinian states, although nothing is said of a Palestinian state in those. We believe that everyone must res respect the principle, not a word about Palestine without Palestine. Our proposal remains in force to bring together all external actors who have influence on the various factions in Gaza and the West Bank and who can if they speak with one voice, help overcome the division within Palestinian ranks. 
An important step in this direction was taken in Moscow in February of this year when all Palestinian factions sent their delegations to Moscow in order to speak out in favor of restoring unity on the basis of the Palestine Liberation Organization platform. Today, we all have a responsibility to stop the unfolding human tragedy. In addition to the military operation in the occupied Palestinian territory, this is Israel's other neighbors are also at risk of being drawn into a major confrontation with Israel. Tensions along the blue line between Lebanon and Israel are growing by the day. Israeli officials have publicly announced plans to open a northern front. Hezbollah is also prepared to join the fray and warns of its readiness to fight back against invasion. In Syria, the Israeli air forces have multiplied attacks across the country, including areas in Damascus, Aleppo, Latakia, and the Golan Heights. The strikes have hit key airports and a seaport that played an important role in delivering urgent humanitarian aid, including as part of the response to last year's devastating earthquake. Dear colleagues, ending the violence in Gaza and the West Bank can create conditions not only for finding a lasting solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but also for tackling other crisis hot spots throughout the vast expanse of the Near and the Middle East in accordance with Security Council resolutions, rather than certain geopolitical ambitions or rules that the West attempts to use to replace the UN Charter. An important role in upholding the rights of the Palestinian people is, of course, played by pan-Arabic and uh, organizations whose activities we support as we support the efforts of all truly responsible members of the global community. I would like to particularly note the importance of the Gulf states now after the extraordinary elections in Elan and the initial statements of the new Iranian president. Mr. Pazesh Skian, there's hope for rapprochement among all the countries of the Gulf Coast in the interests of overcoming long-standing differences and mistrusts and joining efforts on a mutually acceptable basis in order to determine the parameters of their own mutual security without external interference and to speak with one voice to realize the aspirations of the Palestinian people and generally build an architecture of stability and good neighborliness in the region progress on the Palestinian track in full compliance with UN decisions, progress in normalizing relations between the countries of the Gulf Coast, all of this would be an important contribution to the objective process of forming a common Eurasian architecture based on the principles of indivisibility of security and equal collective responsibility, mutual respect, and a balance of interests. I resume my function as the President of the Council and 